Uh, Michael Ottenlips is our guest speaker tonight. He got a bachelor's degree at Hendricks College, which is a little liberal arts college about the same size as the College of Idaho in Conway, Arkansas. Uh, Michael's originally from Missouri and went to undergrad in Conway, Arkansas. Um, that's probably as remote as to some of you saying, where are you in Caldwell, Idaho? And where? <laughs> well, Conway, Arkansas. Where? Um, and Michael then uh, did a master's degree at Boise State University, um, just down the road here. And um, in the meantime, between his graduation in 2014 with his bachelor's degree, and when he started at BSU in about 15 or 16? 16. 16. That two years, he worked for the Missouri uh, Department of Conservation. He had a, had a brief spell with Monsanto, uh, working on plant research there, um, and a couple of other positions along the way. But he's going to be talking to us today about research on a group of plants that I have been collaborating with his supervisor with for s several years now. And um, if any of you follow up on this and are interested in pursuing research related to biscuit roots, which is what he'll be talking about, I encourage you to get in touch with me and talk to me about opportunities um, in the next couple of years. So um, I'll leave it up to Michael. Go ahead, Michael. We're very pleased to have you here. Yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about work I did at Boise State for my master's degree. And we'll be looking at um, evolutionary relationships of biscuit roots and desert parsley in Western North America in desert ecosystems as well as alpine ecosystems too. But first I'm going to give you kind of a broad overview of kind of this type of research. So as we know, speciation is an ongoing and complicated process. process. It is usually associated with morphological change and frequently this morphological change can occur in reproductive characters. A really nice obvious example of this is shown in this species of orchid from uh, Madagascar, a Malagasy orchid, with these very, very long nectar spurs. And so we see uh, plant pollinator interactions driving this speciation process, resulting in these changes in reproductive characters and morphologies that are associated with the speciation process. You can see the pollinator here, this hawk moth, with a very, very long proboscis that can reach the nectar at the base of this nectar spur. And so the existence of these nectar spurs was actually, excuse me, the existence of these incredibly long proboscises was hypothesized by both Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace. I'll give you five bucks if you can tell them apart. Um, <coughs> after observing these incredibly long nectar spurs. However, it is not always that straightforward, where we have these really, really clear reproductive morphological characters. So in that case, we have what can be called, defined as cryptic species, which are poorly differentiated morphologically. And in these cases, molecular or DNA-based data can help us kind of fill this void. Void. So you can see in this example of grape ferns here, of trichium species, the pinnae size and shape, that is the fern um, fronds, the size and shape doesn't necessarily correspond to any species boundaries. It can be very, very difficult to tell these apart in the wild, the field, or on herbarium specimens. So in these cases, molecular data can really, really help. However, there are a wide variety of additional factors that can complicate species delimitation besides this notion of cryptic speciation. Um, and I'll kind of go through these as the talk progresses. One is hybridization can be a big problem, highly phenotypically plastic species, complicated evolutionary scenarios such as incomplete lineage sorting and other forms of reticulate evolution, and then more broadly, there's a wide variety of species concepts and theories out there <clears throat> that deal with some of these issues. And so hybridization clearly flies in the face of the biological species concept, which states that <clears throat> species are groups of non-interbreeding populations. Sometimes it's referred to as reticulate evolution, as you can see in this diagram here, where two species that have been separated in time have some gene flow shared at some point in time in their past or potentially ongoing, which is when it's frequently called reticular evolution. Sometimes it's pretty easy to tell apart, such as in this um, rudimentary example where these yellow and blue flowers hybridize so readily even their pots turn green down here. However, um, frequently it is not that easy to tell apart, and you need, again, molecular data can help fill that um, gap. <clears throat> 
Other types of species delineation problems we could have are highly phenotypically plastic species. So this is an example of a Hawaiian tree, shrub, forb, kind of depends on where you are, um, called Metrocidieros polymorpha. So Metrocidieros polymorpha exhibits a wide variety of habits. Um, in early successional communities, it's kind of this low-growing shrub. Uh, it gets kind of windswept on the seaside and then the tree line, and it can form, I mean, that's a full-blown tree in a climax community. And additionally, this plant exhibits a wide uh, range in leaf morphology along an elevational gradient. So if it wasn't for these really nice, obvious flowers um, in Metrocidieros, it would actually be very, very difficult to tell apart, say, an early successional um, individual from a climax community individual. You mean it would be hard to, hard to tell that they were different species? Different species. Yeah, or the same the species, same rather. Species, they look so different. Exactly. Furthermore, we can have complex evolutionary scenarios such as incomplete lineage sorting. And here we have problems when individual genes coalesce, or that has come from a lineage that is not the most recent common ancestor. And so in these cases, if we were to look at individual relationships among gene regions, this would not match up with the overall relationships of the species. So you can see here there's kind of a disconnect um, where if we look at individual relationships or individual gene trees, they do not correspond to the overall species tree. And we'll revisit this concept a little later on and how it relates to um, species delimitation. And finally, there's a wide variety of species concepts and theories out there. Uh, we introduced the biological species concept a little bit early on. However, there are a wide variety of so-called phylogenetic species concepts, which are generally concerned with uncovering monophyletic groups frequently using molecular data. The genealogical species concept is one type of concept. It states that species reside at the boundary between particulate, that is interbreeding, um, and divergent genealogy, and they contain no included taxa, which is essentially getting at a monophyletic group, so they are no more closely related to other members, excuse me, they're more no, no more closely related to themselves than they are to any other populations. Michael, can I interrupt and have you just draw what that would be on the board just briefly? Yeah, we can look at that. Because uh, I think that some of the people in the audience might not know what you mean by monophyletic group. Yeah, so essentially, if we were to sketch out a, let's go down here, sketch out a phylogenetic tree. You can envision each one of these tips would represent a separate species. So we might have species A, B, and C here. Ooh, excuse me. <clears throat> and so a monophyletic group would simply be referring to one of these branches and not including, or excuse me, one of these branches defined by a node. So we could pick, say, these two or all of them but we couldn't reach across nodes and pick these two or these two. So basically, it has to be more closely related to its brethren than something else. And the genealogical species concept is essentially kind of a more um, drawn out version of that with getting at this kind of genealogy looking at these gene trees. And so some of these cases have really just shown it's kind of a lot of complicated things that are showing that morphology is basically not always reflective of species boundaries. And so DNA-based evolutionary trees, which are frequently concerned with uncovering monophyletic groups, can be used to infer these species relationships. So essentially, we'll either start with plants from either the field or an herbarium sheet, and we will extract the DNA sequence that DNA, basically build out these long, these long sequences, A, T, C, A, G, et cetera, et cetera. And then we'll use um, computer programs to infuse statistical models to build evolutionary trees, kind of with the goal of looking for these monophyletic groups. It's kind of a basic overview of how morphology, molecular data, and uh, plant systematics all relate together. And so there are two basic types of molecular data that are frequently used. One is an older technology referred to as Sanger sequencing, 
And here we use anywhere between 1 and 25 gene regions, or 1 and 25 genes. And with this technique, it can be challenging to account for incomplete lineage sorting, reticulate evolution, or other complicated scenarios. This technique's been around well, probably since the late 70s, early 80s, but really came into fruition in the 90s and early 2000s. You can essentially think of this as kind of less data with simpler procedures and kind of a lot of lab work and older technologies, but it's still very, very useful. And this stands in contrast to next generation sequencing, where we have somewhere between a 50 and 10,000 fold increase in the number of gene regions. So you can essentially think we have a very small amount of data here and just lots and lots and lots of data here. And by having a lot more data, we're able to use more complicated um, computer software, more complicated uh, to infer more realistic evolutionary scenarios in some of these cases with heavy ILS or reticulate evolution. And so today we're going to be looking at two different studies and one will be using Sanger sequencing, the other will be using this newer next generation sequencing technology. And so again, we'll have two case studies in Lavatium species. One, we're going to hang out in the Alpine, actually not in this mountain range, but... And here we're going to have very distant evolutionary relationships where we use Sanger sequencing to uncover species boundaries. Um, we have Lamatium greenmanii, Greenman's Lamatium, Organ's Lamatium, and then a little more fun, Redfruited Lamatium, Lamatium erythrocarpum. And then we'll have another much longer discussion in the desert using a much more closely related species complex, which is uh, a pretty complicated group with some of these phenomena that we discussed in the introduction occurring. And it's generally referred to as the Lamatium tridentatum or nine-leafed biscuit root species complex. And it includes uh, interesting and rare members such as Lamatium cardii, who's actually named after uh, Pat Packer from College of Idaho, um, and Lamatium andrusianum, who is found mostly in the Boise foothills and a little bit east and is named after the Cecil Andrus. Former governor. Former governor, yeah. Thank you. Of Idaho. So Lamatium as a broad genus is a member of the Apiaceae family or the carrot family. And these are pretty common wildflowers in the early spring. Um, and kind of persisting as fruit into the uh, mid to late summer. And so a lot of you have probably seen these before. Uh, they're generally these early blooming yellow spring perennials. Uh, Lomatium cows, this photo was taken actually not very far from here, um, over off Highway 95 in um, the Oahe Front. <clears throat> this photo of Lomatium gray eye was taken on Table Rock right outside Boise, Idaho. And this photo of Lomatium multifidum, which is a, kind of a little bit different stature, it's much broader, um, kind of comes up here with some different colored flowers, was actually taken in the uh, Sucker Creek Canyon, again, not too far away in Oregon. And so not only did I pick these because they're kind of nice, maybe obvious members that you maybe have seen before, but also they kind of exhibit a lot of the kind of ongoing taxonomic rearrangements that have been going on within this group. So Lamatium multifidum has been split into two different species, um, Lamatium dissectum on the west side of the Cascades and a little bit in North Idaho, and then Lamatium multifidum here locally. Uh, Lamatium grayi has undergone some similar taxonomic rearrangements, and while Lamatium caus is kind of one name for now, uh, it's possible some folks at New York Botanical Gardens and a few other places are kind of looking into this, the morphology and molecular biology of Lamatium caus as well, as it's kind of showing a similar pattern of just being kind of complicated. And a lot of this research has actually been done at College of Idaho, so yeah, Emma George was an undergrad here, is that right, Don? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. Emma George is the lead on this paper. She was an undergrad with Don, and then uh, there's some folks working at University of Wyoming and University of Illinois as well, too. And so we kind of have this nice clear-cut case in the Alpine where we essentially have Three species, um, Lomatium greenmanii, Lomatium organum, and Lomatium erythrocarpum. They're found in two mountain ranges, the Wallawas and the Elkhorns, and I'll show you a map in a second where that is. And earlier work suggested that these two species were really, really closely related, um, but we'll kind of investigate that hypothesis in a minute here. And then also it's worth noting that these are rare plants found um, 
kind of exclusively in these populations I'm about to show you. So here we have, um, where's Baker City? Baker is right around here. There's Baker. And so if you're getting gas in Baker, I always tell people it's the, these are the big mountains to the north. And in these big mountains to the north, we have the only known populations of Lamatium greenmanii. It's essentially only known from three sites. We have four populations of Lamatium origanum. And then in the Elkhorns, to the kind of southwest of Baker City, we have a couple more populations of Lamatium origanum, and then the only known populations of Lamatium erythrocarpum. And so some of this early molecular and morphological work suggested that these two, this is Lamatium origanum here, and B, this is <clears throat> Lomatium greenmanii here, suggested that these two species were closely related. And this is essentially, this Lomatium erythrocarpum here is the only other kind of alpine Lomatium in that area. And so we use seven, seven gene regions in Sanger sequencing, so seven regions. And we essentially took each one of those genes, and there were about a thousand base pairs or one base pair is like an A, a T, or a C, or a G. They're about a thousand base pairs long each. We put them together in one analysis, and we used a few different measures of statistical support, uh, maximum likelihood, parsimony, and Bayesian inference. Maximum parsimony you can basically think is like Occam's razor, kind of kicks out the simplest solution, minimizes the number of changes from an A to a T or a C to a G. And with those seven regions, we actually saw that these species were very, very distantly related. So the Sanger sequence data, the concatenated analysis, again, just all those genes together, shows that these individuals come out in very, very different parts of the tree. Obviously, you can't read the names there. It's not quite important. But it's just worth knowing Lamatium greenmanii falls out way in this clade, Lamatium erythrocarpum in this clade, and Lamatium origanum in a completely separate clade. So earlier hypotheses that these might be closely related have proven to be wrong based on this taxa, based on this data. And we have about 210 or so individuals representing about 80 species of Lomatium in here and some other uh, closely related allies. And so some famous botanists probably quite said it best with a lot of this. It's a lot of molecular data to say perhaps this means only that most alpine umbler for A, or the old name for APSA, tend to re resemble one another. And so, in the deserts uh, outside of this area, in the Oahis, and kind of some other parts of Oregon, Idaho, and Washington, kind of have a much more complicated scenario. It's not quite as clear cut as that easy case in the alpine where we just looked at seven regions, three taxa, and it was very easy species relationships. Here we needed a lot more data. And so we'll kind of review a few more concepts before we move into that. And so you can think of speciation existing on this continuum, beginning with populations, then moving, moving into some structure between the populations, finally having some subspecies, and then maybe distinct kind of non-intervening species. And in sepient speciation, kind of exist somewhere along this continuum. It's like, is it here? Is it here? You might have heard taxonomists or other people say, like, fuzzy boundaries. And this incipient speciation and species continuum idea kind of gets at that fuzzy boundaries. And so a lot of these fuzzy boundaries can be caused by this phenomenon of incomplete lineage sorting. And again, incomplete lineage sorting is when these gene trees and these species trees just don't match up. So if we were to look at just those Sanger sequence data, that can be highly aff afflicted if incomplete lineage sorting is going on. Basically, we're not getting the full idea, the full picture, by only looking at a small representation of the full gene of the genome. We're only looking at seven genes. How many genes are in a genome? You know, I don't actually know, but a lot. <laughs> so seven is a very, very minor representation of that. And we're going to be using in this next study, next generation sequencing technologies to get a much broader picture of the genome, and by having this much broader idea of the genome, we're able to build separate genes, separate trees for each gene, and look at species relationships that way. And we'll talk about that even more. And so this whole field is kind of broadly known as phylogenomics. So it starts with this next generation sequencing data. We sort all of that data into full genes using 
kind of bioinformatics tools, and then we use some of those same traditional techniques that we talked about at the beginning of the presentation, um, traditional molecular systematics techniques to have this broad phylogenomics. And so the Loatium chartered group is a species complex that's kind of found throughout Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. It's generally described by having kind of these three, um, what they call a triternate leaf morphology, which is essentially three sets of three as you go up the stem. Um, while they all share that kind of similar basic arrangement and these yellow flowers, we have kind of a vast array of differences in leaflet size and shape. So, for example, we've got these really, really wide leaves, which are found in some parts of central Idaho. And then we have these really, really narrow leaves as well, found in other parts of Oregon. And so, uh, Don and my advisor at Boise State, Jim Smith, in 2018, published this paper where essentially they used those Sanger, Sanger sequencing techniques we talked about early on to investigate the relationships within this group. And essentially, kind of most importantly from that, they pulled out this member here, I. It's got these really long linear leaflets. And these long linear leaflets um, turned out to represent completely different species. It's falling out in a very, very different part of the tree, different monophyletic group, one of these branches down here, this branch right here, as the rest of this species complex. And the rest of this complex, uh, everything but I on this, essentially is for the most part, kind of a big mixed up mess. And that's what we'll be talking about today. And so sort of one of the most confusing aspects of it, it showed that this is Lomatium triternatum, nine leaf Lomatium. This is Lomatium picardii, Packard's desert parsley from, again, pa Packard. And it showed that these two were essentially interchangeable genetically, that they were the exact same, which clearly you can see they're fairly different morphologies. This is found kind of near Moscow, Idaho. This is found in the Oahis. Pretty different habitats as well as geography, too. And so kind of what's going on with this relationship? Doesn't make a lot of sense. Furthermore, embedded within there, we have a variety of Lomatium bacardii specimens. And they're kind of denoted in this yellow here and here. So they're sort of clustered in the Oahis. Um, and you can see that these purple morphologies and blue morphologies are essentially interspersed throughout. And that purple morphology is represented by this long, wide leaflet plant, which was originally described as Lomatium anomalum. So essentially, you would think that the Lomatium anomalum would form one nice clade, one nice cluster, and the Lomatium cardia would form one nice cluster, but that obviously <laughs> didn't happen with this Sanger sequence data. So that drove us to investigate other hypotheses. One thing we originally thought is maybe it's cooler and wetter in the north. I said it's a desert. The north's not really a desert at all. Um, and that's causing these wider leaflets in these prairies. The warmer and drier south is having these narrow leaflets. However, there are some other confusing morphologies present and some specimens here where it's cool and wet that have kind of this same morphology as down here. And so this is essentially a diagram just showing a lot of overlap between these morphologies. And you can even see sometimes this morphology is even overlapping on the same plant. Got a nice wide leaf there, leaflet, and some narrow leaflets throughout the rest. Yeah, there you go. So the, the point being there's a, the colors don't... They're all like mixed up, all essentially. Different. And so that drove us to this research question of... What is kind of causing these incongruences between the molecular data, morphologies, and geographic distributions of populations within this species complex? And essentially, there are three basic hypotheses. Uh, one, individuals could be highly phenotypically plastic, kind of that hypothesis we looked at a second ago, where these different morphologies are caused by different environmental conditions. Two, potentially some of these historic evolutionary patterns, such as incomplete lineage sorting and articulate evolution, which we discussed earlier, are failing to be reconciled by Sanger sequencing, and possibly a next generation sequencing technique will show that these are in separate taxa, or three, it's some kind of combination between these two hypotheses. And so, the goal of this study is to use a variety of information, so there's eco ecological, morphological, genetic, to ascertain species boundaries, and understand the role of complicated evolutionary scenarios 
the phenotypic plasticity and the evolution of this group. And so how we did this, kind of the first step was to basically go collect a bunch of plants, collect the plants for inclusion in the herbarium, um, dried the leaf material in silica gel to extract the DNA. We looked at soils, mineral content, and particle size. Uh, we looked at a wide variety of environmental variables to kind of confirm that cooler and wetter northern hypothesis versus the warmer and drier south. We also did a wide variety of morphometrics in the herbarium, looking at leaflet width and length, as well as looking at uh, principal components analysis of the reproductive characters to see if kind of a series of reproductive characters cluster together. It's essentially a clustering analysis. So for our next generation sequencing techniques, we extracted the DNA, and then essentially you put these little tags on the end of each DNA chunk, and these little tags help you amplify that DNA. We pulled out 353 genes were amplified um, using PCR, and then using a um, next generation sequencer, you're able to sequence all of these genes at once, and that's kind of the main difference between next generation sequencing and Sanger sequencing. Sanger sequencing is kind of one at a time, whereas next generation sequencing does it all in kind of a cluster, and then those tags we put on earlier allow us to pull each one of those out. And this was a newly developed kit, which amplifies 353 genes, uh, which are common throughout all of angiosperms. So actually a lot of other people are using this, and so the idea is to build this as part of this larger um, plant tree of life project that is actually based in the uh, UK. So this is a very small segment of that, which we can talk, ask questions about if you want. And so essentially we took all of those little, basically they're little fragments of gene regions, and we put them all together using a variety of uh, programs, mostly on Unix computers and some scripting. And essentially what we were left was this data set consisting of 54 what they call intronic regions. So exons are coding regions of DNA. So exons are pretty conserved because you don't want to mess up your coding region. If you mess up your coding regions, you might not be able to see or something like that. So there's not a lot of changes. Where there are a lot of changes, though, is in these flanking areas, the intronic regions, which are actually much more common than the exons in the genome. And so we used these highly variable introns and pulled out 54 full-length introns from there. So 54, you know, we're not in the thousands like some of the really good folks are getting, but 54 introns is a lot more um, information than seven uh, more conserved gene regions in the Sanger sequencing. So we took two basic approaches. One was the similar approach that we talked about in the first half of this lecture, where we treated all of the genes as having the same history. So here we took each one of those 54 introns and essentially this is actually what it looks like on the computer. They're just one after another, after another, after another. You know, it's 60, 70,000 base pairs long. And by doing this all in one, we can't really account for any of these gene tree, species tree conflicts. <clears throat> and so to account for that, we use what is frequently referred to as a coalescent based approach. What you essentially can think of, instead of building one tree, we built trees for each individual gene. So each of those 54 introns, they had their own phylogenetic tree. And then we took uh, a software program called STACY, and STACY essentially models the process of speciation much more accurately than you can with this concatenated approach. It models that um, process of speciation accounting for incomplete lineage sorting and reticulate evolution simultaneously. So this works really, really well in groups that have recently evolved, very young evolutionarily, or groups that may be hybridized rapidly. And we're expecting that to happen with all of these because these have been shown to be quite young. And so our major findings, this is looking at that first data set where it's a similar type of analysis is to our um, Sanger sequencing. And we're seeing some of these things are starting to begin to fall out into nice groups. We have a lot of Lomatian Picardi eyes are clustering together. However, we're still finding a few kind of floating in the sort of ether out here where just like their placement doesn't quite make sense. And that's just because the, the colors aren't the same in the same evolution. Yeah, exactly. So Lomatian Picardi eye is pink here and down here. This Camus Prairie variety <laughs> is blue here and blue there. So it's kind of all scattered throughout. However, when we use 
this coalescent based approach where we're accounting for incomplete lineage sorting and building these individual gene trees, we basically see that all of these colors are now clustering together. So Lamation picardii is coming out, sharing this node as a monophyletic group. Lamation, this Camus prairie variety is coming out together. Um, the nine-leafed Lomatiums are coming out together too. So essentially we're getting a much more clean picture showing what we think is actually going on with these plant species. Instead of this is just kind of a continuation of this messy data that we were originally seeing um, with the pilot study. And so here's just furthermore showing not only do these correspond to some previously identified species boundaries, it also corresponds to these um, geographic groupings. So we have kind of the Awahis down here. Um, these are of the Boise Foothills variety, Lamatium and Drusianum, which I think extends a little bit this way as well. Um, and you're seeing very, very tight geographic clustering as opposed to this kind of mixed upness from before. And furthermore, this kind of seems to correlate into some core structure with environmental variables. So this kind of broadly, it's split into a northern and a southern group. Again, the northern being confirmed as being cooler and wetter, and the southern as being warmer and drier. This is essentially a clustering diagram called a PCA, where you can see we had basically answered about 19 or 20 different variables into this. And you can see that these northern variables cluster together and these southern variables cluster together. And furthermore, we see kind of proven that that leaflet width and length is loosely corresponds with uh, the length average on this axis and the width average on that one, which having these kind of northern wider leaves and longer, and these southern leaves that are um, narrower and um, not quite as wide and as tall. So, and then there, there is a little bit of overlap in the middle there, too. And so we're seeing this morphological variation within this group still, so it's not quite all figured out by that molecular data. Um, we're seeing the widest leaflets in the widest environments, which is kind of interesting. Um, and that's these right here. It's morphology A. So it's in the Camas Prairie outside Grangeville. If anyone's been up there, we were up there just for work. Um, yeah. However, we still have some kind of confusing things, such as these Lomatium triternatum counties from, this is a county in southern Washington. It's a similar climate as the north, but has this different leaf morphology. You can see here kind of these long linear leaflets. So morphological variation and phenotypic plasticity is not the sole culprit of these incongruences. It's also a lot to do with this uh, incomplete lineage sorting phenomenon from earlier. So kind of the goal of this from before was, what about species boundaries? And so for the first time, Lomatium picardii has actually been recovered as monophyletic, which is actually kind of an exciting, it's a pretty big deal. There was talk actually originally from the Sanger sequencing paper of maybe incorporating it with Lomatium anomalum, but we're finding that this is indeed kind of a rare taxa endemic to the Oahis, so Pat Packard won't get too mad at us, right? <laughs> we're not dismantling her name. It's a... Uh, so, but we're showing maybe it's possibly a little more common than thought, extension a little further west into Oregon, potentially a little bit further into Idaho too, pending some other results. And I think actually, uh, most excitingly, we're finding that this Lomatium picardii actually has pretty distinct uh, fruits as compared to the rest of this clade. So the fruits are actually a little bit shorter and wider um, with these kind of more broad um, leaflet wings, or wings along the fruit there. That's all kind of clustering together again, just another PCA. <clears throat> this one was kind of a challenge, Lomatium anomalum. Leaflet morphology suggests that it should be this kind of whole northern group I showed earlier. However, kind of a nomenclatural consideration shows that in molecular consideration that the type collection, so this is that northern clade, this is the southern clade, the type collection actually occurs down here in this southern clade in kind of the Man Creek area. So basically, uh, kind of the plant naming rules prevent us from calling this northern group Lomatium anomalum. So we're still kind of in the process of disentangling where Lomatium anomalum will fit in all this. This was exciting. We showed that uh, Lomatium triternatum was not actually most closely related to these specimens from the Oahis. So that relationship from the Sanger sequence data turned out to be pretty bogus. 
And we're actually finding that Lomatium trigonatum, so the original collection, this is the type, it's Don repeating the type collection, um, which was originally done by Lewis of Lewis and Clark fame, was actually found kind of near um, Moscow, Idaho, up in the north central part of the state. And so now we're looking at maybe a very narrow circumscription, looking at Lomatium trigonatum, when it was originally a lot of people think of Lomatium tridonatum as being this really, really widespread species where we're thinking it might actually be much more um, localized than previously thought. So just some minor conclusions from this desert Lomatium stuff. What I really think is going on here is we've got this kind of case of incipient speciation. Um, some of these groups make a lot of sense, such as the Camus Prairie grouping, uh, Lomatium picardii coming out together. Oh, there's not as much. The Lamatium Anomalum stuff is still pretty confusing with the uh, Man Creek and Hell's Canyon. I'm just as confused as everybody else with that one. So I don't think we've really kind of crossed that boundary into full-fledged species for a lot of these. Some of them probably have, others of them haven't. Um, kind of showing that, remember that continuation continuum from earlier, probably existing somewhere in that subspecies species range. But it's an ongoing process, it's a developing science. There are some kind of conservation implications of this. So now that we're calling it Lomation picardii officially, we'll hopefully keep it on the rare plant list in Oregon and Idaho, which is very important because there's a lot of habitat loss ongoing in the sagebrush step uh, from things such as cattle grazing, off-highway vehicle use. This is actually um, a photo taken in the early spring in the Owyhees, and there's a picardii population. It was still vegetative when I was there, like running through here, and it like, Someone drove their dirt bike or ATV like up this way and up that way and just tried to get to the top of the hill or whatever. Um, so off-highway vehicle use, also fires um, can cause problems for these things, increased fire frequencies. And actually a problem, which not, not for most of the state, but for the Camas Prairie is actually agricultural conversion. Most of the Camas Prairie outside Grangeville has been largely converted to, uh, they're growing like alfalfa and wheat and barley up there. <clears throat> So the Lomatium from Camas Prairie is essentially restricted to ditches, right-of-ways, and roadsides, not forming this big map that it used to, presumably. And so our final overall conclusions, the distantly related species, this is taking a big step back, um, such as those alpine Lomatium we talked to, can be easily resolved with a comparatively small amount of data, such as that Sanger sequence data, we can figure out these relationships, be very, very confident among distantly related things, what these boundaries are, um, if we have as low as seven or eight or 10 or so regions. However, when we're looking at much more closely related species at kind of this finer scale, such as in some species of desert Lomatium, um, it takes a lot more data, which we'd use frequently in next generation sequencing and more complicated analyses, such as these coalescent based analyses to resolve these species boundaries. And so with that, um, I just want to thank a few people. I didn't, I did, I talked today, but a lot of people did a lot of other work. Um, I had a teaching assistant sit from Boise State. Um, there was a lot of crowdfunding with donors from the Lomatium and Drusianum campaign. If anyone went to the farmer's market in like 2016, you probably saw us there. Um, Q Gardens in London, the Pactel team, Jim and the graduate committee, including Don, um, we had some fieldwork grants from the Idaho and Oregon Native Plant Societies, as well as um, some other funding from ASPT, and then a wide variety of kind of social support from me, PSU grad students, um, and the research station who I'm working with now. So with that, you can take any questions, and here's a nice photo of the uh, Camas Prairie. There's a little, little mission. Yeah, I'm more than happy to go over any of that if you want to. Hey, what's up? So you said that there, some of the species were not quite species, like they're still possibly in the subspecies range. So how do you tell when they actually become their own species? Yeah, that's a good question. It's, uh, it's kind of a lot of times it can be sort of a judgment call incorporating a wide variety of other data sources. So I think, for example, I like to kind of look at congruence across groups. 
So I think a good example of that would be this Lomatium picardii. So not only do we have kind of the shared geographic range, shared molecular data, we also have shared reproductive morphologies and the vegetative morphologies, that is, leaves, are very, very similar. So that kind of is more evidence that this is likely a full species. Whereas something like this group here, see these squares and the brown and the yellow, um, they kind of come out in separate places on the phylogenetic tree. They have somewhat similar morphologies. If you look at the morphologies, um, and they're sort of in disparate places. Like there's kind of no reason why these wouldn't be clustered together um, in the molecular data based on morphology and um, geography. So I think that's kind of a case where it's probably, there's not enough evidence to warrant calling those two separate species. Whereas when we have, for example, the Picardii, we have the shared reproductive characters, shared morphological characters, shared genetic characters, and shared um, geographic characters. It's kind of looking at this congruence across all data sources. Yeah? Why do you think it's important to know like, specifically what species these are? Like, why do you need this taxonomy to such a high level? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's kind of multiple, I think, ways to answer that. Um, kind of maybe the most pragmatic answer would be that some of these are managed, so actively being managed as rare species by either the BLM or uh, the state of Oregon, actually. So the Idaho BLM manages rare species, the state of Oregon also manages rare species kind of separately. So understanding those boundaries can be very, very important from this very practical conservation perspective. Like, I actually have done surveys for Lomation Picardii for like NEPA type things. So, which is essentially just regulatory stuff if you're going to be doing like some kind of development or treatments. So there's very, very um, pragmatic reasons such as that, but I'm more interested in just kind of sort of the unknown and exploring and it just sort of kind of gets at you sometimes when you see these original trees that don't really, like why don't the colors match? <laughs> sort of this inherent like lust to know what's going on underneath the surface. Can I add one other yeah, little please. thing here? Um, if you find, and people do in this particular group called Lomation and Bristol Roots, a medicinally important component, like, a, let's say, a painkiller. Okay, now, we, we know that Native Americans used a lot of these biscuit roots for various foods and medications. And suppose that they found it with a population that we don't know where it fits. Over on that, you know, we don't know based on what it looks like, which species it is. Suppose it has a, a painkiller. And you go out and you find something else that's called the same species, but because it might have the same color, but isn't really as closely related. Okay, and so the taxonomy doesn't quite fit. And you go and you go to the herbar or to the to the medicine chest, thinking you're getting a painkiller, and instead you get something that's got some medicinally active ingredients but they're laxatives instead of painkillers. Now, you're not going to be a very happy camper, are you? Taking something that's a laxative. You all know what a laxative is, right? Okay. You need to be able to know that a plant that you're giving a certain name corresponds with other studies that are important in understanding what that plant is useful for, like medicinally or conservationally or whatever. So the name really matters. Oh, yeah. And you can't just call all these things the same thing because they're obviously evolutionarily different. They've got different chemistries, too. We don't know anything about the chemistry yet. Yeah. Actually, <laughs> someone needs to look at that. <laughs> yeah, if you got more, that's fine. Uh, OK, so like you found like more distantly related species on that one mountain, but they were all like kind of like on the same mountain. but like. In this whole region, you're finding very closely related species, but they're all very like separated from each other. Do you know like how that works or like why? Yeah, I mean that's a good question. And so a lot of people thought originally that these, this green and blue one here, um, found in the Wallawas, they thought that those were like really closely related. They're like they look pretty similar. It's this, these two. 
they look similar, they're in similar areas, similar habitats, people thought they were really closely related. Um, but so sort of as kind of doing it as this pilot, we look at these, the Sanger sequencing first because it's a lot more inexpensive and a lot easier to deal with. Basically, it's like a few days of lab work and then like two hours at the computer and you're good to go. So we use that as sort of a pilot to see that these were not closely related. So then we didn't have to delve into the next generation thing, which is a lot more labor and time intensive. But yeah, it's, uh, it's surprising. But there, there is that, that, um, that convergent evolution thing. Yes, and that's essentially what It's, it's what like happened. you had two different, yeah. two different ancestors mm -hmm. that during the last glacial retreat left some descendants up on top of the mountains as, the, as, as basically as glaciers retreated and everything moved up to the tops of the mountains where there was only gold terrain. Mm -hmm. But different, different ancestors sort of evolved similar morphologies, which is why they look the same, which is why we thought they were more closely related. But in fact, they come from different ancestors. Why? Because, of, and this tells us stuff about the evolutionary history of the, the landscape, the last glacial retreat, and things like that. These yeah, are, it allows you to really think backwards in time of like, what happened, how did this happen? And this is actually a pretty common pattern throughout a lot of other plant species across wide uh, evolutionary distances. Yes. Yeah. What's your favorite species of lomatiums? Of lomatiums? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I don't think it's Picardia. I'm sorry. I spent too much time looking at it underneath the microscope. I think it's the prettiest. Yeah, it is very pretty. There's it's a nice one there. I actually think I like the one that you described with um, Michaela, Ravinii variety Pyotensi. Oh, with, with Kim Carlson. With Kim Carlson, Kim yeah. Kim Carlson, that's mm -hmm. where we first got started in the mid-2000s. Yeah. yeah, it's just this fun little one. It's a fun little thing. Yeah, I like the little ones, the belly plants. Yeah, belly plants. <laughs> yeah. It's one in the deserts down uh, in South of Hawaii. Yeah, Ravinia, that's a nice one. That's a nice one, yeah. That thing, we named that after the Paiute Indian tribe. Um, Lomatium Ravinii Paiutense. I don't know if there's someone who can answer this question, but like how Native American tribes used to um, like dig up common fruits, are these related to? So they're, they're not closely related to the commas roots. Um, if you look here, I can show you this nice picture from, so this is outside Grangeville, Idaho. Um, and they call this like the Camas Prairie, actually. And this is a very selective shot of the roadside, actually. <laughs> so most of this is like a field, agricultural field. And essentially, these purple flowers here are those Camas flowers. And so uh, native peoples used not only the Camas roots, which are not very closely related to the Lomatiums, but they also dug up Lomatium roots in a similar fashion, hence the common name biscuit root. So if we look at one of these photos here originally, you can kind of see this tuber, where was that? I think it was right at the top. That tuber at the bottom, here's a good one. This tuber right here, I mean, uh, a lot of native peoples like pounded that out into like a cake, let it dry in the sun. I've actually heard it was occasionally mix mixed with huckleberries um, to make it a little bit sweeter because you imagine it would dry you out. And uh, Lewis and Clark actually in their journals wrote about eating uh, biscuit roots and canvas roots kind of simultaneously. They claimed it gave them like dysentery, but there's a lot of other things that they could have been, been exposed to. There's yeah, I, I, there's a lot of things Lewis and Clark could have been exposed to. So I think it was a safe, reliable food source. Yeah, but that's like, I think a good example of that like big, big root. And sometimes we have a few in our herbarium that are huge. Like really, really big. Yeah. No, that's a good question. And there's actually a lot of work about that. 
Okay, one more and then yeah. we'll close it off. One more question. Surely you must be more than some. Okay. All right, well, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you guys.